my name is Paul Taylor and I have uh, two stories for you uh, this afternoon. Um, one is the story of my uh, grandparents uh, who came from a little village called Chagford in the south of England near Plymouth and the story of uh, their birth and their families and their immigration to Canada. The second story relates to the construction of the family home at 3251 Eldon Place in Saanich. It's actually near the corner of Harriet Road and Burnside. When uh, my mother went into Oak Bay Lodge and we started cleaning out her house, um, I came across this, uh, this wonderful wooden box. And uh, the box is really nothing special on the outside. It's uh, um, not uh, particularly valuable. Looks like an old jewelry box. Uh, veneer is sort of coming off it and uh, uh, not particularly valuable. But what I found inside is priceless. Um, inside this box was some uh, old family documents, uh, birth certificates, uh, marriage certificates, and uh, all that sort of information and information about uh, 3251 Eldon Place and um, various uh, family, old family documents. So let's, let's dig into this box and see where our story starts. Well, the first thing that I found in there was uh, an envelope in, with my father's writing on it, which is uh, uh, interesting for me because my father died about 15 years ago and just to see his writing uh, makes me sort of connect with him once again. And inside this envelope I have a, uh, I'll start with my grandmother's birth certificate, she being the oldest. On the 26th of June, 1883, at uh, 3H Prospect Street in Plymouth, Isabel Henriette Smith was born. Her father, Ernest John Smith, her mother, Henrietta Louisa Smith, formerly Eastley. Her father was a schoolmaster. Now, I don't really know much about uh, these people. My grandmother, obviously, I, I knew, but her father and mother, um, I never met them. Um, she was brought up by her grandparents, so there obviously was something happened, um, and I don't know what that is. Um, a common thing that happens when I reach into this box and pull out a document is, is uh, documents raise more questions than they answer, and I frequently find I wish I could turn the clock back 40 years and talk to them about the things that I've learned from the stuff in this box. Um, and I, I suspect that that's common among people who are digging into their family history that they wish they could go back and talk to the people um, that they're looking at. Next is my grandfather. Now my grandfather was born on the 5th of January, 1888, in Chagford. Dennis John Taylor, his father was Eli Taylor, and his mother was Mary Jane Taylor, formerly Bennett. And his father was a journeyman mason. And uh, I know quite a bit more about uh, my grandfather's family. I asked a friend of mine, or a friend of mine actually volunteered, her name is June Perry, to do some hunting for me uh, on the internet and found some very interesting things. Um, she brought, uh, gave to me the, uh, some census records from, from England. The first one was in 1881 and, and lo and behold in the 1881 census I find a skeleton in the Taylor closet. Um, I find uh, Eli and Mary, J, T Mary Jane Taylor were living together. They were 28 and 27 years old. They had a daughter, Alice, who was six years old, and a son, William, who was one. Uh, we also found their marriage records, and they've only been married for two years. And they have a six-year-old daughter. That I did not know. My, my mother did not know. Um, it didn't stop them, though. 
in 1891, uh, 10 years later, they now have eight children, and their ages are, well, Alice would be 16, and she's not mentioned on the census, so, you know, perhaps she's, I don't know, in service or has a job, or maybe even is married, I, I don't know. Uh, William's 11, Aunt Mabel, she's nine, Frank is seven, Anne is five, my grandfather Dennis is three, he, he has a younger brother James who's one, and Amy who's two months. Um, this turns out this was the end of the children, and when you read 1901 census, uh, my great-grandfather is no longer there, and it turns out that he actually died in 1892. Well, that put a stop to having children every two years. Um, in 1901, um, more children are out of the house, and uh, I would imagine that my great-grandmother, Mary Jane, uh, would have had some difficulty with with all these children at home and being on her own and and uh, and and that certainly ties in with the the family recollections that my grandfather only had a grade four education and and after grade four he he was out of the house and he got a job and was helping to earn money to support the family so he um, he was into his adulthood he was an unskilled manual labor that's that's what he was and uh, that's about as much as I know about his life in England. But I uh, um, wish that, uh, that I could have asked him, or, or, or both of them, um, about the decision to come to Canada. That would have been a big step for them, you know, because obviously they didn't have a lot of money. They probably hadn't traveled anywhere. Um, they're living in a little village called Chagford uh, in near Plymouth and they probably they haven't been very far and when they made the decision to come to Canada all of a sudden they're going halfway around the world now this must have been you know I, I wish I could talk to them about what went into the decision and why did you decide to come to Canada and, and Victoria in particular I, I mean I'm happy that they did obviously um, but I don't know. Um, I was reading a book once called McCulloch's Wonder, which is about the building of the Kettle Valley Railway about 100 years ago. And one of their problems they had in building the railway was a shortage of unskilled manual labor, which is what my grandfather was. Now, he never worked on the railway, but they were advertising all over the world for people to come here. And I imagine that others were too. And it's probably an ad like that, that, uh, that brought my family here. And there were, in fact, many, many ships. When I started looking for, you know, which ship did they come over, you know, when, when I started looking for that information, oh, there were so many of them that it, it, you really, you needed a place to start. Let's go back in the box. I have their marriage certificate. Another interesting thing is these all, the writings my dad's writing, and he's been gone for 15 years, so it was uh, it was kind of interesting to to see his writing uh, brought him to mind. My grandparents were married on the 4th of April, 1912. He was 24, a bachelor, a laborer. Uh, my grandmother's 28 and a spinster. I wondered when I was reading this with her father being a schoolmaster and, and him being a, an unskilled laborer whether there was any like, animosity in the family about her marrying below her station or anything. But then she was 28 years old, which was kind of late. And uh, so probably they were happy that somebody would <laughs> take responsibility for it. I don't know. I don't know. And it doesn't matter. And it's you certainly can't fault them. They were married until death us do part in 1976. April 1912 was the start of a very busy month. Um, they got married, as I say, on the 4th of April. Um, it's unlikely they ever set up a household together in England. Um, on the uh, 20th of April, <clears throat> he and his brother-in-law, um, one of the children I, I told you about was uh, Anne, or Aunt Annie as I knew her, um, 
her husband, Frank Harris, and my grandfather together would have taken the train, I assume, up to Liverpool. And on the 20th of April, 1912, they boarded the SS Canada in Liverpool, and they landed in Halifax on April the 28th, probably hopped right on the train, and ended up in Victoria probably about a week later. Um, my grandfather often said that he arrived in Victoria with uh, five dollars in his pocket, and, and that was quite likely true, but he didn't tell me about these. Um, this envelope here, when I got into it, contained three letters of reference that he had gathered, and these are all dated like April 15th, 16th, and 18th or something. Um, and I won't read all of them to you, but I will read one. Uh, just um, just to, to tell you what, uh, what kind of a man at least someone thought he was. This is dated the 18th of April in Chagford, Devon, England. It gives me the greatest pleasure to testify to the high character of Mr. Dennis Taylor, who is sailing this week for British Columbia. He is emigrating solely to better his position in life. I have had the advantage of knowing him from childhood and see him almost daily. It is, after all, a very small town. He is one of the most honest, industrious family, all brought up in this little town. I have never heard of anything in the slightest degree detrimental to himself or any member of his family. His industrious habits have always secured for him constant labor with the best firms in the neighborhood. His character is beyond question, and I do not know of any young man in his position of life whom I could more conscientiously recommend, not only as a worker, but for any position of trust. I shall always be glad to learn of his advancement in life, and am assured that he will continue to prove himself as he has been an honest, industrious, reliable, and thoroughly conscientious man. I can recommend him as such with the greatest pleasure and with unqualified confidence, signed George Smith, District Councillor for the Parish of Chagford. And armed with these letters, I suspect that he got work fairly quickly because by September, he'd sent for my grandmother. And I found, uh, with some help, I found my grandmother uh, leaving England on the SS Sicilian, which sailed from London on the 19th of September, uh, stopping in Plymouth, where they got on on the 20th of September 1912, and depositing them in Quebec City on the 30th. Uh, again, I, I would believe that they hopped right on the CPR train and headed straight for the West Coast. Indeed, on the uh, on the passenger list, and I, and I have those, those documents with me, on the passenger list she is listed as coming to join her husband in Victoria, B.C. So she was headed right here. They wasted no time when uh, my grandmother arrived. My Uncle Roy was born in August uh, the 8th of 1913. Um, Again, when my grandmother came out, she came out with, uh, with Aunt Annie, her sister-in-law, and they already had a three-year-old son by the name of Charlie. And by um, January of 1914, they had amassed enough money to uh, buy a piece of property at 3251 Eldon Place. And that leads me to this. This is the building permit for the, uh, for the house. Now, uh, I believe that they either bought the land for $400 and it cost them $500 to build the house or the other way around, I can't remember which, and it really doesn't matter. And the permit fee was $1. The estimated cost of the construction was $1,000. And they proceeded to build this house at 3251 Eldon Place, which is still standing today. And we'll get back there in a little bit. There would have been no plumbing or electricity in this house. It was just your basic box uh, 
with five divided into five rooms. There, uh, the heat would have been a wooden coal stove in the kitchen, a fireplace in the living room. And this house was home to the two couples, uh, Uncle Frank and Aunt Annie and their son Charles and my grandparents and my uncle. And like anybody else, they had some problems with their neighbors. And a while ago, this letter was republished in, in a local newspaper. This is a letter that my grandmother and Aunt Annie wrote to Saanich police about a problem they were having with the neighbors. May 21st, 1915. Dear Sir, I am writing to know if our neighbors, Mrs. Rudd of Burnside Road, cannot be stopped from tying her cattle so as to let them stray in the road on Elden Place. All last summer we were annoyed by them at night as well as by day, and on complaining to them about the nuisance, we were simply laughed at for our trouble. Now it has started again. On going out by my front gate last night about nine o'clock, I nearly fell over a bullock, which lay right across the gateway. There were two of them. This morning, up to about half past nine, there were three right in the middle of the road. Last week, there was a pony tied there and let stay there all night. Tonight, it's just 10 o'clock and they have just tied up the cows again. We are disturbed nearly all night by the chains which are attached to them and at times by their bellowing. Not only have they long lengths of chain, but there's a long rope which allows them to stray quite away. Cannot be something done to stop this? I can just feel my grandmother's indignation. I do not like making complaints about anyone, and I do not like being unneighborly, but I think we have put up with this nuisance quite long enough. Trusting this will be seen into, I beg to remain yours truly, B. Taylor and Aunt A. Harris. My grandmother was known as Belle. So that would be her and Aunt Annie. And I suspect my grandmother wrote that. She was the type who would write a letter like that. Um, the Rudd family, of course, is, that's who Rudd Park was named after, if you're familiar with Rudd Park on, uh, on that uh, corner there. OK, now you remember when we had the blizzard of 1996 here and everybody said, that's the worst one we've had in 80 years, right? Well, let's go back to 1916, 80 years ago. My father was born in the aftermath of that blizzard in 1916 on the 28th of March, 1916, in the house at 3251 Eldon Place. Here's his original birth certificate. It says his birthplace was Saanich, BC on the 28th of March, 1916. Gordon Dennis Taylor. At that point, there's now uh, seven of them in the house, and it's getting a little bit crowded. So let's see what happens next. Here is the lawyer's bill for transferring the half share of the house from Mr. Frank Harris to, it says, Miss Isabel H. Taylor, which is not correct, it's Mrs. The, lawyer, the law firm was Pooley Luxton and Pooley, the bill was $18.60, of which was $12 legal fees and $6.60 in disbursements. Um, I asked my mother about this, and she said, yes, they, uh, Grandma paid $600 to buy out the half. And the Harrises took the $600 and went and bought a place over on Duplin Road, which was like about a block and a half away. Nineteen twenty five. Indoor plumbing comes to three two five one Eldon Place. Here's a bill from the plumbing firm of JC Hawking, plumbing and heating, repairs, etc. To the installation of a new bath, hot water boiler, copper coil, connecting range, etc. etc. one hundred and fifty dollars. Uh, this is October the seventh, nineteen twenty five. Um, there's no mention of a toilet. Uh, certainly when, when I got to the house in the 50s, there was a toilet. So somewhere along the line, that was added. Uh, I, and I, I don't know whether one was there at this time or not, but there's a clawfoot bathtub. I remember it well. 
and the range boiler. The range boiler was behind the wooden coal stove, and of course, in those days, you wouldn't have any hot water unless the stove was hot. It wasn't until the 60s that my dad put a 110-volt uh, immersion heater in the range boiler that was there at that point so that they could have hot water all year. Okay, we have another building permit. $50 estimated value for the construction of a woodshed and workshop. Uh, 8th of April 1931. Uh, the permit fee has uh, increased a little bit. It's $1.05. Um, my grandfather apparently built that himself, but when he moved over here, of course, he was working for a construction company. Uh, so, you know, he probably had learned how to build these things. Another building permit in 1936. In 1936, and uh, I'm thankful that my father wrote on it what it was for. It's for the enlargement of a sitting room. And you can see on the, the aerial picture that I have over there on the table, you can see where a bit has been added on to the living room. Again, the permit fee was $1.05. There's even a note in pencil at the top, refunded 45 cents. So you know, they went and paid a dollar and a 50 cent piece to get 45 cents back, right? Now we have, and there's a bunch of these, and I, I, won't, I won't look at them individually, a bunch of property tax notices. Did you know in 1921 the property taxes on this property were $12.47? Again, there's a note on it that they were given three cents change. <clears throat> these came, are still in the original envelopes with three cent stamps. And here it is. They come from the Corporation of the District of Saanich in Royal Oak, Vancouver Island, British Columbia. On the bottom of this envelope, it says Saanich, the Garden of Vancouver Island. And uh, there's a whole bunch of these from 1921 to 1938 is the latest one. Just for fun, I went, gee, I wonder what the property taxes are today. And they're two thousand four hundred forty-seven dollars and three cents. There's, there's the three cents, and uh, that's like two and a half times what it cost to build the house in the first place. The next item that I found in, is for 1937, and I suspect that many families had had something like this. But in 1937, I have a picture of um, the an observation car in Vancouver. There's a date on the back, August 7th, 1937. And uh, if you look carefully in this picture, you'll find my grandparents who are sitting right here. I, I don't, have no idea what they're doing in Vancouver because they probably wouldn't go over there very often, uh, except that uh, my uncle uh, eventually settled in Vancouver and perhaps they were visiting him. Perhaps it was even their wedding. I, I don't really know, but anyway, here they are and an observation car in Vancouver in 1937. I'll just give you, leave them in, in that observation car for a bit and give you an update on the rest of the family, see what they've been doing. My Uncle Roy, my uncle, my mother used to call him the Casanova of Saanich. Now, I guess he had a, a bit of a reputation. <clears throat> uncle Roy, for a time was uh, worked for the CPR and he was on the triangle run from Seattle to Victoria to Vancouver. Apparently he had a girlfriend in Seattle and her name was Phyllis. Well, he had a girlfriend in Vancouver and her name was Phyllis. And he had a girlfriend in Victoria, and you guessed it. <laughs> he married the one in Vancouver and uh, they were, I, I don't know when their wedding was, they were married uh, again, all their, the rest of their lives. Uh, they had one son, David. Uh, my cousin Dave now lives in southern Ontario somewhere. I've kind of lost track with him since his parents are gone. And Uncle Roy died in 1988, and Andy Phyllis was a couple of years after that. My father, Gordon Taylor. He counted among his friends a fellow by the name of George Ball, who uh, went on to uh, establish Ball and Schemmel. 
the radio firm at the corner of Burnside and Harriet. He had another friend, a, a kid by the name of Ronnie Gordon. And he, he and Ronnie were, were playing in a field, I think, at uh, Burnside and Harriet somewhere. I, I imagine it's around where the um, 7-Eleven is today. And between the two of these guys, they managed to start a grass fire. And uh, I gathered Dad beetled off home, but kind of gave himself away when the fire brigade arrived and all the kids in the neighborhood took off and we've got to find out what's going on. Oh, no. I'm not <laughs> he wouldn't go. <clears throat> and I think that kind of gave him away. There's probably a trip to the woodshed happened after that. Another guy he met at Ptolemy School was a, a kid by the name of Don Davidson. And uh, he and, and Don Davidson became lifelong friends. And in fact, uh, my dad was to marry his younger sister, Pearl. Um, in the 30s, Dad, uh, uh, of course, he was born in 1916, so he came of age in the 30s. Um, he started a, a watchmaking apprenticeship with a guy by the name of Frank Coverdale. And, and I remember my dad saying that, that old man Coverdale often said to him, and if we were still in England, you'd have to pay me for this. And uh, dad made a dollar and a half a week for Mr. Coverdale. He gave the dollar to his mother, and the 50 cents, he said, was enough for he and his girlfriend, my mother, to walk from Burnside Road to town. They could go to a movie, they'd share a milkshake, and walk home. And that pretty much ate up the 50 cents. After he finished his apprenticeship, um, he discovered he couldn't really make any money watchmaking, and so he joined the Navy. Well, we all know what happens next. A couple years later, um, he's on the North Atlantic. While we're talking about the North Atlantic, um, let's go back to 1912 for a bit, because uh, one thing that occurred to me during the month of April in 1912, uh, you know, the time when they're they're planning on coming over here, of course, on the 14th of April, 1912, Titanic sinks. And they must have heard that either just before they got onto the train to go to Liverpool to get on the boat, or maybe as they were walking up the gangplank onto the boat. I wonder how they felt about that. But it obviously didn't change their plans any. Um, Mom and Dad uh, were engaged on February the 14th, my father the romantic, Valentine's Day, 1943. Um, they were married uh, uh, on September the 20th, 1943. I, I gather my dad, uh, it seems the war still on at this point, and he uh, arrived back in Halifax from convoy duty and sent a telegram saying, I'll be home in five days, and they must have arranged that wedding very quickly put it together in a short time. He, he apparently arrived back here on a Friday. They were married on the Monday. They were together for two weeks and then away he went again and she didn't see him for 14 months. Uh, like his parents before him, they never set up a household here. Uh, at that point, she continued to live with uh, her parents, my grandparents, and uh, it wasn't until he came back from the war. Then, of course, he came back, I don't know, must have been April, I guess, of 1944 that he came back because my brother was born on January the 13th, 1946. So Dad was home by April of 45. Um, my sister came along in 1948. And then father went back to war. He's in Korea. He's on the HMCS Athabascan, um, which is stationed out of Sasebo, Japan. Dad came back on the 19th of May, 1951. And I was born on February the 2nd, 1952. Dad always said that I had Japanese beer in my veins, and I always gave him a bad time about coming home with a bag full of green jelly beans to throw out in the lawn for my brother and sister. And history repeats itself again. Dad married the girl next door. They lived right around the corner. Liz and I grew up 
a block and a half apart, met in grade one at Burnside School, and uh, we've now been married for 41 years. Let's go back to Dennis and Isabel. Um, they continue to live at, uh, my grandparents uh, continue to live at 3251 Eldon Place. At some point the oil stove, the uh, wooden coal stove was uh, changed to an oil stove and uh, an oil heater was installed in the, uh, in the living room. Um, I can remember my grandmother uh, cooking uh, Christmas dinner or, or any family dinner in, in winter in the in the kitchen, it would be so hot in the kitchen that you couldn't stay there, and yet you'd open the door and go into the hall, and you'd just about freeze. I'd seen ice in that toilet. Um, in fact, there was one winter. I think it was the winter of '68, '69, where we had a, a prolonged cold snap, and the house froze up. And they came to live with us and drove my mother crazy. Um, my grandmother died on the 2nd of February, 1976, which was my 24th birthday. They sold the house about three days before my grandfather died on the 19th of December of 1976. After I found all this stuff, I did up a, a document. Uh, outlining the history, complete with some of the permits and all that sort of stuff. And I went around and knocked on the door at 325 Eldon Place to talk to the current owner. And there was nobody home. So I left it in the mailbox. She got back to me later. We Eventually we went around for tea and, and uh, had a nice chat with her. It's actually a, a young woman whose parents own the house and she lives in it. Um, a number of things have changed, but there are some things that are still there. Um, there was a pear tree outside the living room, and it, it's gone. Um, they took out the pear tree and they put gravel. Someone used that area right in front of the living room window for a, a, a place to park a car, and they took out a pear tree to do it. Uh, in the backyard, my grandfather had a rose garden, and you can see it in one of the pictures there where I have two pictures of the backyard. One, you'll see a rose garden, and it's gone now. It's just grass. Uh, my grandfather always had a vegetable garden, and it is still there, as is the woodshed and workshop, but you wouldn't recognize the inside of it. She took us in there, and, and it was bright, and uh, she was using it as a studio of some kind, and. Uh, like I remember that as a dark, dingy place where the, all the tools were kept. Inside the house, the uh, the oil stove, of course, is gone. Um, they must have upgraded the electrical system because they, they've got electric baseboard heating, and they never would have had that uh, on what was there. Looking into the old pantry, the old pantry is now a laundry room, but right in the back of the pantry, right where, where it always was when I was there back in the 50s, is the old sink with the funny old set of faucets. It's still there, and of course it's now the receptacle for the, the hose from the washing machine as the washer dryer sits right there. Into the bathroom, there's the old clawfoot bathtub. It's still there. Uh, it's in a different place. It used to be over here. Now it's over here, but it's still there. Um, there's an electric water heater on this side, um, but the bathtub is still there with a, again with a funny old, the original funny old set of faucets that I remember, the two knobs that came out and the spout, yeah, I remembered it. Not much change in the, uh, in the living room, except that the heater's gone. That's it. That's the story of uh, 3251 Eldon Place and uh, of my grandparents coming to Canada. Thank you very much, Paul. Okay. As always, did you answer your question? Uh, you bet. Shoot. And if you want to look at the stuff, help yourself. This is how I discovered it. Yeah. But this is how I found it. Right. Now it was it was all in kind of random order, you know. I uh, I was pulling stuff out of the box and going, oh, is that interesting? Well, you know, it wasn't until I sort of sorted it in order, and and really there's as I say there's the two separate stories, uh, until I sorted it that way and looked at it together that I you know put all the stuff together about the Titanic and all that sort of stuff. Ah. Which seem to account for a lot in those days. 
Okay. Um, nobody ever said that about my grandfather, but he was he was not a drinker. Uh, he'd have a drink, you know. He, he's he's not. But alcohol was not a problem for him. Yeah. No, I mean I think you know like where he came from. With Uncle Don for years, yeah. and they got into all kinds yeah. of mischief. I've heard tales of, you know, taking the gates off the gate and climbing up a telephone mm -hmm. pole and hanging it way up there, and the streetcar would come out. When my grandparents built this house in, on Eldon Place, people said, what do you want to live way out there for? Yeah. Like this, it's beyond the end of the streetcar line. Well, my dad and my uncle, these two little buggers, used to go and hide in the bushes, and the streetcar would come along, and they'd put pull wires off the back of the streetcar, oh, back into the bushes. <laughs> and of course, the operator That's would get back in. And, yeah, so anyhow, they got into all kinds of trouble, I'm sure. Sure. Um, I was working away at my desk in, I worked for ABC Electric at the time, and I got a phone call from my life insurance agent, who was a golfing buddy of Tory McCall's. And he said, there's an opening at McCall Brothers, you should apply for it. Oh, and by the way, use my name as a reference. I've known Tory McCall for years. And I thought, well, that's handy. Thanks, App. I'll do that. And I was actually looking for something different. Updated my resume, dropped it off at the funeral home. I fully expected the phone to ring saying, come in for an interview. Nothing happened for about a week. I got a letter in the mail saying, Dear Gordon, you didn't read my resume, did you? <clears throat> Dear Gordon, um, we don't need you. We found somebody else. And I went, oh, okay, I guess my friend Ab is not a, as good a friend as he thought he was. <laughs> and uh, five months later, I'm still sitting at my desk at ABC Electric. I'm still looking for something else in the phone rings. Hi, this is Dave McCall. I went, oh, hi. He said, a few months ago you put in an application. I said, yes, I did. He said, are you still interested? I said, yep, I am. And he said, well, I'll come in for an interview. So the next day, they must have wondered why I was wearing a, my best three-piece suit in ABC Electric, which was not a place where you wore a three-piece suit. But anyhow, um, I did. I had an interview, and I, I just, it was the most unusual interview that I've ever had. I sat there, I just, just like this, and yacked with him for about a half an hour. Uh, there was no way he was going to ask me any accounting questions about you know, what I knew about accounting because, oh, well, I'm a CGA, I guess that speaks for itself. He was just interviewing me as a person. Um, when I left, he said, I want you to um, ask your wife if she's okay with you working in a funeral home. And I went, I really don't think she cares where the money comes from, but I'll ask her. <laughs> and sure enough, Liz says, oh yeah, sure, I don't care. And he phoned me the next day and he says, well, did you ask her? I said, yeah, is she okay? Yeah, okay, when can you start? Twenty-five years later, when I retired, I still had that letter. I framed it and I gave it back to him. <laughs> I have some interesting funeral stories. Oh, yes, uh, One of our guys one day was positioning a casket over a, is that those are still running? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't necessarily want this on the, posted on the internet. Was it out at Ross Bay, uh, positioning a, a casket over a grave on Ross Bay? And he knocks the cell phone off his belt and it goes, And of course, splash, yes, splash. And of course the family saw it and they started to laugh. And he sort of looked at them and they said, Dad calls us later, he can tell us where he is. <laughs>
another story, a, uh, a man came in to make arrangements for his wife. And he brought a, a woman with him, which is, is quite ordinary for someone to bring someone else in to help them make the funeral arrangements. I sat down in the arranging office with our director. Everything was quite normal. It was going to be a burial here in Royal Oak. And the funeral director says, well, you know, it's quite um, normal, but you know, when, when you, you buy a plot for your wife, sometimes you reserve the one next to it for yourself. Would you like to do that? And he says, well, I don't know whether I'm going to need two or three. And he turns and looks at the woman beside him and she says, well, you haven't asked me to marry you yet. And he says, okay, will you marry me? She says, yes. He says, only three. <laughs> at this point, our director said, I'll leave you two alone for a minute. And he came out and he, like, he's, I can't believe I heard what I just heard. Well, it turns out that the man's wife had had Alzheimer's. And for some four or five years, she hadn't even known who he was. And he certainly wasn't going to divorce her or anything, but he got on with his life and had a girlfriend. Well, then now that his wife has died, they can get married. So it's not as, maybe not as sinister as it seemed. Right, okay. Well, I remember our family got a television set when we lived in Halifax. Dad, of course, being in the Navy, uh, was drafted to Halifax in 1954 and we came back in 56 and somewhere in between that we got a television set. It's one of funny old big box things with the spindly little legs on it. And and in Halifax, and of course there's five of us, right, in, in, living in naval housing in Halifax, there was never any arguments about what to watch because you either watched the CBC <coughs> or you didn't. Well, we actually Seattle stations we could get. Yes, we had a few more, but not a lot. And when CBC came on, just in time for the Commonwealth Games, that's when it started. But when we came out here, of course, in 1956, then all of a sudden, there were more things to see, and that's when the fight started. It's pretty good in 56. Quite a lot of jobs. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're different down 10 for each channel. Oh. Yeah, one for channel 12, one for channel 5, one. Yeah, they on the roof, I think. Oh, we had we had an aerial just outside our back door, and yeah. and you on a windy night you needed two people to watch TV because you had, someone had to go down and turn the antenna. You needed someone up in the roof. Yeah, that's okay. Oh, a little more. Oh, back the other way. You know. And then, as I say, on a windy night, trying to watch it by yourself, yeah, that's crazy because you come upstairs and the wind would turn it around and you go. Oh. Now four of my, well, my grandfather and three of his siblings came out here. And, and I know about the one set, obviously, Uncle Frank and Aunt Annie, that they, they came out together. There was another Aunt Mabel and her husband, uh, Uncle Jack, uh, and, and Jack and Frank Harris were brothers too. That, that always caused confusion. We had two Harris brothers marrying two Taylor sisters. And I ha still to this day, I have problems keeping people separate who they are. Um, and, and Grandpa's brother, Frank Taylor, uh, and his wife, Emily, and, and I don't know when they came out relative to when everybody else came out. But I, I was lucky enough to have met all of these. Some of them in Australia. Australia. Yeah. 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 Now, my mother's family, by contrast, uh, came out to Winnipeg. Uh, my grandfather uh, came out to Winnipeg uh, my grandmother came out, and I'm not sure whether she arrived on May 31st, 1914, or whether it was June the 1st, 1914, but they were married on the 1st of June, because she's not going to stay with them until they're married, right? Yeah. So they were married almost as soon as she landed, and then, and then my aunt was born in, in May of 1915. But during the Second World War, <clears throat> whatever the men got any leave, they were married immediately. Mm -hmm. I know yep. my sister was too. I think perhaps there was, they expected the men to die and there was a pension. If you were, I, I, do, I never just knew that, the reason. 
But I mean, some of those men came home, they didn't even know the wedding was planned. <laughs> I was pretty small, but I knew uh, what was going on. Well, I'm pretty sure. Uh, I'm pretty sure my parents knew that the wedding was. was but I will. Dad, Dad would have known because they they, they were engaged. Yeah, they married yeah. them pretty quick. Yeah. 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 When, came. when mom and dad did get engaged, and they told my grandfather, my mother's father, he said, "Well, it's about time. Like you've been hanging around this house for 15 years already. You know, what took you so long?" People didn't say that about us, though, did they? No. Liz was 19 and I was 20 when we got married. They said, what's your hurry? But we said that to our son-in-law. That's right. What took you so long? What took you so long? Yeah, they were 30, what were they, 31 when they got married. Her daughter went. They do get married later now. They do, yeah. Our, uh, our youngest daughter uh, turned 36 in May and just presented us with our second grandson oh. a week ago. Less than a week ago. Yes, and they're having the babies later too. Yeah, I don't think they're having any more. <laughs> Our other daughter will be 38 next month, and she's not married and has no children. But actually, she's got 23 children. She's a teacher. Yes. Yeah. Well, it, I think it's Good great reason. to have your choice. Mm -hmm. Good reason not to get married. <laughs> <laughs> So great. feel free to look over the stuff that I've spread out on the table, and, and I'll go back there if you uh, want to talk about that. Yeah, yeah. And that's the trouble too. You find all these pictures with no names on them. Oh, I have that problem. Uh, Liz, Liz's dad was one of these guys that, that uh, he was born in 1915 and grew up in an era where photography was new, flight was new. And he was into all that stuff. And we've got a wonderful collection of uh, photographs that your dad took. And he was very organized. He put them into albums and he's labeled them and whatnot. I've got some old family pictures and I've taken them to my mother, who's the only one left now I can talk to. I have no idea who that is. There's one there that looks like me. The picture of a guy who looks like me. I don't know whether he's my great grandfather or who he is, but he looks like me. What makes us all realize that we should get in, isn't it? Well, uh, that's one problem I anticipated having, uh, you know, with my grandfather being a tailor and my grandmother being a smith. I'm going, oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> the problem isn't, you know, finding something. The problem is finding so much stuff and not knowing who's who. And uh, I. I can get to my great grandparents, but beyond that, I, I really, it's, it's always a work in progress. This is going to be ongoing for quite a while. There's not too many different ways to spell Paul. <laughs> I once had a bowling team, of course, being in the, in the funeral business, I once had a bowling team that I nicknamed the Paul Bearers. That's sort of like the story of the, of the couple that have been married for a long time and, and the wife says, dear, if I die, would you get married again? Mary thinks about that and he says, well, I don't think I'd, I'd want to live alone, so I, pr I probably would. And she goes, oh, okay. Um, would, would you let her drive my car? And he says, well, yeah, I see, well, you wouldn't need it. Uh, I guess it would be okay. It's only sitting there doing nothing. Oh, okay, she says. I guess that's okay. Would you, uh, would you let her sleep in our bed? And he says, well, you know, if I was married to her, I think that's kind of appropriate, don't you? She says, well, I guess so. She says, would you let her use my golf clubs? He says, oh, no. Oh, no. That, no. She says, well, I don't understand. You'd let her drive my car, you'd let her sleep in the bed, and you wouldn't let her use my golf club. She said, he says it would never work anyway, she's left-handed. 